The founder of the Orlesian Empire, Cordillus Draken, used a dragon as the symbol of his family and his empire. But today, golden lions, not dragons, feature so prominently in Orle. For the lion is the symbol of the Valmont family, which displaced the Draken dynasty during the Exalted Age 400 years ago. The start of House Valmont lies in the end of the Fourth Blight. In 524 Exalted, the Darkspawn Horde had devastated Antiva and the cities of the Free Marches for 12 years, but the Grey Wardens had led a united force of Marchers, Antivans, and Anders that managed to force the Darkspawn back into Antiva and Ravain. They confronted the Archdemon Anderal and the Horde at the Battle of Islay, where the Grey Warden Garahel slew Anderal and ended the Blight. But that's a story to be explored more fully another time. Also on the field that day was a force of Orlesians. Orle had hardly been affected by the Fourth Blight and had sent only a token force to aid the Wardens. Among that force was a young Captain Lambert Valmont. Lambert distinguished himself that day when he disregarded the orders of his superiors and led his forces to relieve the beleaguered Antivans. A later rumor has it that Lambert was motivated by fondness for a particular Antivan camp follower, though that has never been proven. As luck would have it, the Antivan forces Lambert saved happened to be led personally by King Azar Adalberto Campagna of Antiva. He was profoundly grateful to his savior, Lambert was elevated to the nobility and offered the hand of one of King Azar's daughters in marriage. His newly created heraldry was a lion, a creature native to eastern Thetis. Following the Blight, Orle and Antiva became close allies, so rather than punish Lambert for his disobedience on the battlefield, the Emperor of Orle grudgingly took the diplomatic step of awarding the most popular Orlesian in Antiva, a Marquisate. Lambert Valmont returned to Orle with titles from two nations and a royal bride, prompting some nobles to nickname him the Swaggering Lion, a slander he embraced. Lambert had four sons and a daughter. His eldest, Alphonse Valmont, led his brothers against the sitting emperor of Orle, Xavier Draken, in a civil war, declaring him to be a usurper. Ultimately, he succeeded in killing the emperor in single combat, inspiring the still popular motif of the lion slaying the dragon. Alphonse ascended as the first Valmont Emperor of Orle. His younger brothers, Isidore de Arlesans, Yvonne of Saverne, Stephen of Valmontaine, were made dukes, a title traditionally, if informally, given to those of royal blood, but outside the direct line of succession in Orle. He also built Chateau Lion, a palace for the Valmonts in the city of Halam Sharal. Alphonse's younger sister was elected to the leadership of the Chantry in 571 Exalted as Divine Amara III, an infamously fanatical divine who is said to have enjoyed bonfires fueled by Maleficar, mages guilty of practicing forbidden magic. Her reign was mercifully brief. We shall move forward a bit to touch on some of the notable Valmont rulers. In 744 Storm, Emperor Freyan Valmont was crowned, and he is best remembered for opening the Chevalier, the most prestigious knightly order of the Empire, to women, where they had previously been banned and posthumously knighting the famous Ser Aveline. In 771 Storm, Emperor Etienne Valmont I ascended to the throne. He presided over the end of the exalted marches against the Canari and is known to have worked to improve trade relations with the dwarves of Orzammar. He is perhaps most infamously remembered for his marriages, however. Emperor Etienne remained childless for 28 years. Under immense pressure to produce an heir, he set aside his wife of 17 years to marry Princess Sotiria Pentagast of Navarra in 782 Storm. The Pentagast family had recently regained the throne of Navarra and were eager to form alliances. However, this new marriage also produced no heir, so in 797 Storm, Etienne put aside Sotiria to marry his mistress, Marquis Yvette. The Pentagasts were not pleased and sent an armed force to retrieve their princess from the cloister Etienne had placed her in. They took no further action for now, 
but the spurning of the Navarran princess is regarded as the start of a long animosity between Orle and Navarra. In 799 Storm, Etienne finally got the heirs he craved when Marquis Yvette gave birth to twins, Reveal and Gratian. The divine took this as an omen and declared that the next age should be the Blessed Age. Reveal ascended his father's throne in 821 Blessed. Three years later, Reveal ordered the invasion of neighboring Ferelden in 824 Blessed in a campaign that proved wildly successful. Over twenty years, the Fereldans were beaten back, and the capital was sacked in 844 Blessed. Reveal was regarded as a military genius and reveled in the praise of his court. But his brother, Grand Duke Gratian, had predicted that committing so much of Orlais' forces to Ferelden would leave them vulnerable to Navarra. He proved correct. The Navarans had been biding their time, looking for an opportunity since Reveal's father sent Princess Soteria Pentagast to a cloister. While most of the Orlesian army was still committed to pacifying Ferelden, Navarra launched an invasion of Orle in 846 Blessed. They captured the cities of Ghislaine, Arlesand, and Perendale. The Orlesians recaptured two of the cities at the cost of much northern territory, but Perendel remains in Navarran hands to this day. The conflict is now remembered as the Perendel War. Reveal became the butt of jokes and whispered critique in his own court, all past glory forgotten. He became increasingly paranoid and erratic. His courtiers told him that it was his brother who was behind the criticism though there is no evidence that Gratian wished anything but success for his brother or expressed anything but relief that he had not inherited the throne himself. Nonetheless, there was open talk of replacing Reveal with Gratian. After the death of their mother, Marquis Yvette, who had always been a calming influence on her son, Reveal lost his restraint. The Emperor ordered his brother's assassination at his estate of Sablissant on the Feast of Ascension. Gratian, his wife, their three children, and eight grandchildren, the youngest Camille being only eight months old, were murdered. Their bodies were thrown into a mass grave and burned. Rumor has it that Gratian's eleven-year-old granddaughter Varine escaped the massacre, but little else is known of her. Emperor Reveal fell into a spiral of paranoia, fearing retribution for the murders. His health began to decline, but he refused to allow any physicians into the palace. He famously began wearing full armor any time he left his chambers, and was said to douse himself in self-made tonics. He refused to leave his room at all by 850 Blessed, and allowed only a single cook to prepare his meals under the supervision of ten chevaliers. He no longer ate anything but venison. Some accounts say that the emperor believed in ghosts. He seemed to believe that his mother continued to advise him long after her death, and that the vengeful shade of his brother sought his destruction. He employed soothsayers to convey messages from the dead, and ward off his brother's ghost. The Mad Emperor died in 851 Blessed. When his sons entered his chambers, they found that he had boarded up all the windows and surrounded his bed with rows of glittering daggers. Reveal left Orle unstable and its aristocracy discontent. His eldest son, Etienne II, became emperor upon his death, but was assassinated only four years into his reign. Rule of Orle fell to Reveal's younger son, Judicale I, in 855 Blessed. His coronation was celebrated by the commissioning of Judicale's crossing in Empress de Lyon. The bridge's ceremonial dedication was overseen by his sister, Grand Duchess Leontine. Judicale inherited his father's political turmoil, which had been exasperated by Emperor Reveal's habit of awarding many new titles to his supporters on a whim, complicating already contentious disputes over inheritance and birthright. Judicale sought to win over the nobles by establishing the Council of Heralds, a body that would arbitrate and deliver the final word on matters of inheritance and titles, including that of Emperor. Judicale also rebuilt Chateau Lyon, the palace, originally built by Alphonse Valmont in Halem Chiral, which had been destroyed by an uprising of the city's majority elven populace early in the Blessed Age. He renamed it the Winter Palace, and it became the heart of the imperial court during the cold months of the year. His interest in the site is said to have been a cult, however. Being a superstitious man, Judicale believed the palace sat on a site of elven magic 
and was fascinated by the ancient and arcane. His son, Prince Renard, shared this fascination with the elves and collected carvings of Hala, a sacred animal to the elves, which his daughter Selene repurposed as door keys for reasons best understood by herself. Emperor Judicale died of old age in 870 Blessed. This is when the dynastic history gets a bit complicated. Emperor Judicale had four children, Judicale II, Florian, Melisande, and Renard. Judicale II succeeded his father to the throne, and with the birth of his twin sons, Princes Etienne III and Leopold, the line of succession seemed secure. That was until the outbreak of the Hundred Days' Cough in 877 Blessed. The disease claimed both princes, and grief-stricken Judicale II subsequently lost all interest in ruling, spending more and more time hunting in the countryside. He died in 884 Blessed when his horse threw him during a fox hunt. Thus the throne fell to his brother, Florian. Florian is remembered as a bit of an eccentric. After the birth of his nephews, nobody expected him to ever sit the throne, and he seemed to prefer to be ignored, living a very private life. Little is known about his activities during his brother's reign, save that he married Justinia of Hunterfell and produced a daughter named Evangeline, whom he showed little interest in. His daughter was also a victim of the Hundred Days' Cough. When the Chevalier came with word of his brother's death, Florian's response to the idea that he should be emperor was, This will not do at all. Contrary to the norm of Orlesian nobility, Florian ignored fashion trends in favor of wearing whatever he found to be comfortable and refused to wear any type of cosmetic or powder, which he justified with an intense dislike of being dirty. He isolated himself within the palace, dealing only with his family. Children, even those of servants, were banned from the palace, save for his nieces and nephews, and only as long as they were kept out of his sight. Florian was generally unwilling to be seen in public or allow anyone outside of his immediate family to see his visage at all. It was customary for the features of the Emperors of Orlais to be commemorated in gilded marble, but when pressed, Florian demanded his be made from a red sandstone found only in the Hissing Wastes, a remote location he hoped would prevent anyone, including himself, from ever seeing it. Work on the project continued throughout his reign, but it was stopped incomplete upon his death. No plans have been put forth to continue the work or transport it out of the wastes. Emperor Florian is rumored to have had an amorous relationship with his younger cousin, Megrin, until he offended the emperor in some way and was appointed to be king of Ferelden, ruling the province in the name of Orlais. Megrin was a cruel and incompetent ruler, propped up by more intelligent advisors. He was unable to quell Prince Merrick's rebellion despite legions of Chevalier reinforcements dispatched by Florian. After these reinforcements faced a particularly terrible defeat at the hands of the Ferelden hero Loghain Mactir at the Battle of the River Dane in 899 Blessed, Florian refused to send any more Chevalier to reinforce Megrin. Around the same time, rather than proclaim the next age to be the Sun Age to emphasize the prosperity of the Orlesian Empire, the Chantry Divine decided to call it the Dragon Age in light of the sudden appearance of dragons in the Frostpacks and Orkney Mountains that ravaged the Orlesian and Navarran countrysides respectively. Megrin was killed, and the Ferelden capital of Denerim recaptured in 9-2 Dragon. Florian refused to make peace with Ferelden or acknowledge its independence for the rest of his reign. During the second decade of the Dragon Age, Florian clashed with the Viscount of Kirkwall, Perrin Threnhold, who was charging exorbitant fees to Orlesian ships. Florian threatened invasion, though to little effect. The Emperor was a personal friend of Divine Beatrix III, who attempted to use the Templar garrison in Kirkwall to pressure the Viscount, ultimately resulting in his ousting years later. As Florian was childless and apparently uninterested in producing another heir, a vicious rivalry bloomed between the families of his surviving siblings, each seeking his favor so that they might inherit the throne. Grand Duchess Melisande raised her son Gaspar de Chalons with the expectation that he, as Emperor Judicale's eldest grandchild, should succeed Florian as emperor. She devoted her life to his success, ensuring he became an advisor to his uncle in her place 
and even naming her daughter Florian to ingratiate herself with him. Some nobles, however, favored the youngest child of Emperor Judicael, Grand Duke Renaud and his daughter Selene. Among these was Florian's own mistress, Dowager Lady Mantelon, a devious player of Orlais's grand game. Florian himself seems to have favored Gaspard, as he reassigned several of Selene's mother's relatives to deprive her of support, including Duke Prosper de Montfort. Florian died in 919 Dragon. It is rumored that Lady Mantelon conspired to have him killed in order to place Selene on the throne. The struggle for succession became violent. Gaspard's wife, Caelian de Ghislaine, daughter of Duke Bastien de Ghislaine, organized a fatal hunting accident for Grand Duke Renaud's wife and Selene's mother, Clarisse de Montfort. Renaud took revenge personally, killing Caelian, only to later die himself from her poison stiletto. Selene, then 16, was orphaned, but not abandoned. She still had the support of many nobles and Lady Mantelon, who advised her to hire assassins to attack her own estate and kill the servants in order to garner sympathy from the nobility. The gambit worked, and Empress Selene Valmont I was crowned in 920 Dragon. Selene's reign is marked by a de-emphasis on the martial history of Orlais. She made peace with King Merrick of Ferelden and renounced Orlais' claim over the kingdom. She even made efforts to arrange a marriage with Merrick's son, King Caelan, though these came to naught with his death. Selene also patronized the arts and the University of Orlais, working to promote her empire as a capital of culture, much to the dismay of some, including her cousin Gaspard, a chevalier. After 20 years of rule, Grand Duke Gaspard once again came to oppose Selene's claim to the throne, deeming her diplomatic approach would weaken Orlais and prove insufficient to counter the growing unrest among the mages in elven uprisings. Gaspard gained much support from the Chevalier and those angered by Selene's easement of discriminatory laws for elves. Ultimately, Gaspard launched a civil war to take the throne from his cousin in 940 Dragon, which came to be called the War of the Lions but that is a topic for another time. The Valmonts have a history of brilliance and instability, with perhaps more of the latter, sometimes expanding Orlesian power dramatically only to lose it. Neither Selene nor Gaspard have produced children, so the legacy of the dynasty remains an open question whether they shall continue to rule Orlais, or if another may come to lay claim to the throne. Well, that's the Valmonts probably the most detailed family history we have in this franchise at this point. Personally, I hope Bioware flushes out more royal history this way. I don't have any big contradictions that I came across this time, so have a nice day. Send a like, and I'll have another video next week.